Well, good morning. morning. It's great to be here with you today. One of the things that I've found in my life is that people have some really strong feelings surrounding participation trophies. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I fall into this category, but I've heard people say that uh, this is such a good thing for our children, like it encourages them. And then there's the other side of the equation where people say, we are encouraging our children to be losers in life. This is the reason for the downfall of America is these participation trophies. And there can become really, really strong feelings around this. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious today, you don't have to be on, on one extreme or the other, but do you feel like a, a participation trophies are a good thing or a bad thing for our little children? We'll do a little poll here. How many of you think it's a good thing? Okay, some of you. How many of you think it's a bad thing? Oh, wow. All right. A lot more, <laughs> a lot more negative response. Here is my child. He did get a participation trophy, and thank you all for judging him for that. Um, wow. I hope the Lord has already convicted you this morning, <laughs> but, uh, oh man, but, but the truth is I, I love sports. I love what sports uh, has taught me. I love what it teaches our children. Uh, so much, so many lessons can be learned um, from playing individual or team sports, but one of the things that's true is you can have situations where um, even as kids get older, like the pressure gets higher. And what, what we never want for our kids is when they're in their lowest moment, if they shoot the shot and they miss and they lose the game, we don't want them to just be stuck feeling horrible. Like that's not what any, I know none of y'all are in that spot, even the uh, negative participation trophy uh, camp here. And because none of us want our kids to be feeling shameful for something that they've done, especially something like that, like missing a shot at the end of a game. But the truth is for you and for me is that every single one of us has experienced shame in our lives. I actually believe this. I actually think that the only people who don't experience shame ever in their lives are sociopaths. So you're in one of two camps here today. (laughs) <laughs> um, but I, I also think, like, I, it, I think the conversation around shame doesn't get had hardly at all. I mean, it's not a super fun one. You're not just like, hey, what's, what's the shame going on in your life today? Like, it's not really how we kick off conversations. But I think that it's a really value and, valuable and important conversation for each and every one of us to look introspectively at what has caused shame Where has shame come from? Why does it exist? And how does it affect our lives? And are we just stuck with it for however long we live? That's the question that we're going to be wrestling with and talking through today. And to do so, we're going to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. It's a story you are very, very likely familiar with, with Adam and Eve. And uh, right at this moment, uh, they are about to partake of the fruit that God said not to do. He, God gave them this amazing, lush, uh, great garden for them to be able to enjoy life and have this full life together. He said, just don't do this one thing. And as we as humanity seem to often do, we say, don't do this one thing. And it's so hard not to do that thing. Uh, you, you know where this, is, where this story is going. But I really want you to pay close attention to to the scriptures as it is read, because I think there's a lot of richness, a lot of things that we can pull from it today. And heck, we can look at their shame instead of looking at ours to start here. All right. (laughs) All right. Here's what it says. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid and he said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, 
What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The, the text goes on to talk about the consequences for the serpent and for Adam and for Eve. And it's at this very moment that sin has entered the ecosystem and our world will never be the same from this moment forward. Can you imagine how horrible at this moment Adam and Eve have never experienced sin or shame in their life ever? And so they experience it for the first time. And, and their first reaction is, oh my gosh, I'm naked. You can almost hear the shame in verse number seven. The eyes of both of them were open. They realized they're naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, I don't know who did it, but can we just take a moment to praise God for whoever created the sewing machine so that we're not walking around today with some fig leaves, especially when those leaves get wiltered around like that could be that could be really challenging for us. So praise the Lord for the sewing machine and for clothes today. I had a friend who used to say a nude beach sounds great until you realize who's at the nude beach. <laughs> Haven't visited yet, but don't have plans to either. <laughs> right, babe? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> things that aren't in your notes. Um, okay. But, but <laughs> speaking of shame, <laughs> seriously, though, I will say this. The, the consequences of shame in our life, if we actually start to peek at it, actually get really, really serious for us. They get really really harsh, actually. Shame can actually keep us from trying out new things in our life because we think, oh, I've made these mistakes in the past. I shouldn't put myself out there. Shame can actually make it so we don't even pursue a partner in life to pursue a significant other or pursue creating a family because we think I've made so many mistakes. I don't deserve that person. There's real huge consequences to shame. Shame can even cause us to actually doubt what God has said is true about us. Like it's still a true thing, but we won't actually believe it, that you are accepted, that you are loved, that God has purposes and plans. And we think, nah, I, I, maybe that's like true for other people, but do you realize what I have done? And so we discount our future because of our past. Shame is an epidemic, and we rarely take time to think about it or talk about it. But I want us, for, a, for just a moment this morning, to think about the effects of shame that have happened in our life. And I know it's uncomfortable, but I think it's really uh, going to be helpful for us this morning. So think about what happens when shame is present in our lives. For Adam and Eve, what happens for them first is their first response when they see shame, it's to hide. It's to retreat. And this is what shame causes for us. It causes us to retreat. In verses 9 and 10, it says this, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And this is our first instinct. Whenever we first feel shame, it's to try to hide it. You and I think, maybe we've even experienced, we think if if people would just see the real me, the true me, they're not going to view me the same. And maybe not only would they not view me the same, but maybe they won't treat me the same. Maybe they won't include me the same. And so for us, we just think like this, this shame is too painful to think about internally, let alone thinking about sharing it with somebody else. Like, no way I'm doing that. We're not sure we can emotionally handle it. And so subconsciously, I don't even think it's a conscious decision, but we, we think, all right, I will just hide it. And eventually, like time is just going to heal this wound for me. And, and so what we do is we try to just kind of bury it. And so what happens is we just kind of push it down and push it down. But guess what? It always seeps out into other ways in our lives. In fact, I will admit that it's, it's very, very hard in this world to make like really good, real friendships. I think it, it really is. I think that's something that doesn't get talked about near enough as well. And if you have good friendships, what a treasure that really is. But you know, one of the things that can really keep us from really good, deep friendships is our shame. 
Because what happens for us is we, we say like, I'm only going to let you see the surface level of who I am. We're never going to get down to the ugly parts of me because I've got this shame. And so a consequence of shame is we don't end up having really good relationships and friendships. It can happen in our marriages too. Shame causes us to retreat. But for others of us, shame can come out in other ways. I've, I've um, spent uh, much time in my pastoral career in counseling, and it's something I uh, really enjoy uh, seeing when people can have breakthrough. And I've met with some like dude dudes, you know, like they're benching 225 like it's nothing, kind of like me, <laughs> kind of. Um, but but these, these dude dudes, they, they've come to me and they've said like, Jonathan, I've got this anger that's going on and like, I don't know what's causing it. And so we kind of start talking through some things like what's triggering this for you? Like what's really going on? And one of the things that's come out in some of these conversations, not all of them, but when we start to get past some of the, just the things that are frustrating them at home or at work and these anger outbursts that are happening is actually where it's coming from is undealt with shame from the past. There, there's things that they have done or, or seen or done to them that they feel shameful about, and their response is that it comes out in anger. And it's when, when we realize in this conversation that these two things are connected, that it's like the light bulb goes on. And that's what can happen for us with our shame. Shame doesn't just cause us to retreat. Shame can cause all sorts of unwanted things like anger to burst out. And we don't even see the connection when it's happening. But it's real and it's true. And it happens regularly for many of us. Another thing that can happen for us with shame is we can try to blame the ones we love the most. This is exactly what Adam does in his moment. In, in verse number 12, it says, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. <laughs> Sounds like men, doesn't it? <laughs> We've been blaming women ever since for our mistakes that we have made. But honestly, this is what can happen with the shame in our lives, regardless of our gender, is we can actually try to blame it on somebody else. And I think the truth is we don't like the spotlight being on ourselves. It gets so uncomfortable that we think like, maybe I'll just push some of this onto somebody else. And what happens in that scenario is it doesn't actually make our shame any better. What we end up doing is we end up hurting those who are nearest and dearest to us. This is exactly what Adam does to Eve. But I know what you're thinking that maybe or maybe what you're thinking is the other side of the coin is like, OK, but if I just like never deal with my wrongdoings, like I'm never going to get any better. And so what we do from that point in that moment is we think, all right, you know what I need to do? I just need to like really drill this into my head. And we start beating ourselves up. We say, like, you are a sinner. You're a wretched sinner. You are horrible. Do you realize what you have done? And what I want you to know is this very important truth about when you are verbally berating yourself inside of your head is that shame is a horrible motivator. Shame cannot change you to become more like Jesus. It never does. And so we've got to stop this negative self-talk of just beating ourselves up. So what do we do when we are in our worst moments or when we reflect back on our worst moments where we have shame in our hearts and in our lives. Because we, we've seen the effects of shame in our lives or how it's affected other people's lives. And I will tell you this, there is a path forward, but the path forward is not easy. Today, this morning, we're gonna choose our heart. I'm gonna invite you to that. So how can we be released from shame? The first step is this, is conviction. It's actually recognizing that you have done something wrong and owning it. This is the moment where you get to decide, am I going to hide? Am I going to keep this hidden or am I actually going to come clean? And, you know, I think for much of my life, I, I thought that this was like a, uh, a moment that was like a, a penalty from God because he was mad at me for what I had done. And to be sure, God hates sin because of the destruction that it wreaks on our lives and on others. 
But I actually view this moment of conviction now as a gift from the Holy Spirit. It's actually the first step for us moving towards freedom and moving out of shame. And that, that flip in perspective, I think, is really key and really important for us. Now, I want to I talk for a moment about the difference between shame and guilt, because these words get used interchangeably a lot. And I think it's, it's really important for us to look at the difference between the two. One contemporary researcher um, says it this way. She says, guilt says I made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. Do you, do you see it there? Like shame becomes your identity. This is who you are. That moment that you are at your lowest, that is who the real you is, is what shame screams in our ear. But what guilt does is say, I made a mistake. And it's actually that guilt leads us to conviction. And conviction leads us to repentance. And repentance leads us towards freedom, away from the mistakes of our past. Do you see the difference there? The re research actually shows this. It actually shows that there is a direct correlation between shame and things like eating disorders, addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, and suicide. But get, but get this. There's an inverse relationship with all of those things and guilt. It's the total opposite between guilt and shame. Again, guilt leads us to repentance. Shame leads us towards repetition. Guilt can change us for the better. Shame cannot do that. Shame leads us to a life of isolation over time. Guilt leads us to conviction. Now, the second thing we need to do after we have been convicted is to confess, to confess our sins. Scripture says this in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. Like everything you have ever done. Yes, that worst moment that you had, you can be forgiven from. And I think sometimes we, we just don't let that seep down deep enough into our hearts. And maybe what's really happening is we haven't forgiven ourselves. But the truth is, is that God has forgiven you. That is good news this morning. Amen. Forgiveness is in the very identity, the DNA of who God is. That's why Jesus came back. That's why we're going to celebrate all next weekend because of what Jesus has done. We've got to start with confessing to God, but it actually doesn't stop there. And I think sometimes this is where uh, we, we think it's enough is like, well, I've, I've talked to God about that. And to be sure, this is the most important part after being convicted is to confess it to God. But there's this another thing that has to happen too. It says this in James chapter five, verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. If you want healing from your shame, it also comes with talking to somebody. And here's the thing. What we always get held up on is like, I don't want everybody to know this. You don't need to tell everybody, but you do need to tell somebody. And, and I, will, I will tell you, it's, it's amazing what happens in this moment when, when you can actually release this. And I'm not talking to, to anybody and everybody. I'm talking to a safe person. Maybe for you, that's your, um, your best friend, or maybe your best friend isn't the safest person and you need to bypass him or her. But, but whoever that safe person is, it can be a friend, it can be a counselor, it can be a, a pastor, it can be somebody that is safe in your life. But we've, we've, in this moment, it's so key for us because it's, it's in this moment where we actually get to feel this release. If you've ever done it before, you, you may have like literally felt the weight coming off your shoulders as you actually say out loud your darkest thing. It's amazing. It doesn't even like make logical sense, but it is a true and it is a real thing that happens when we confess our sins to one another. It moves us to healing. It is what happens. Okay, so after we've been convicted and after we have confessed, the third step 
is to face the consequences. And oh man, I'll tell you what, this is the spot none of us, <laughs> none of us want to deal with. And, and the cost of sin is steep, right? Like that's why Jesus went to the cross for you and for me was to die the death that we deserved. But guess what? He did that for you and me so that we could be free. And when, we, and when we don't live this way, we're not accepting his forgiveness that he wants to give to us. But here's the thing. The consequences component is, is huge for us because we play out all the different scenarios of what could happen. And we've, we've seen the headlines of other people, of them in their worst moment. And not only that, we've heard how people talk about those people in their worst moment. And we're worried that the very people in our lives are going to talk about us in that same way, which should also remind us how we talk even about celebrities matters because it will affect our ability to actually be a safe person for somebody else. But I want you to think about for a moment that there, there are going to be real consequences to our sin and to our shame. And, and we do have to recognize this. But I think for Adam and Eve, when they are caught in their moment where they are, are stuck in shame, like they're thinking our lives are over and we do the same thing. We think like this is the end for me, but it's not the truth. Like think about this for Adam and Eve, like sin invades. They have no idea what the consequences are going to be. God doesn't come in and kill them. Instead, what God says, is there are real consequences to not following after me. But God, they, they, they actually still live their lives. They still, they have to leave the garden, but they still um, are able to have a family. They're still able to enjoy each other. They're still able to have jobs. They're still able to tend to the land. Like it doesn't all end for them at that moment. And it doesn't end for you at your lowest moment when you come clean either. It doesn't happen for you and for me. And, and I think here's the thing is I think we always project out the consequences of what, what it's going to be like if I actually share this thing or these things about me and what I have done. But you know what I don't think we, we weigh the consequences of? Of not coming clean. We don't project that side of it out. You know, how many of our dreams are going to be lost because we wouldn't deal with the shame in our life? How much weight are you going to have to continue to carry on your shoulders? How many nights of sleep are you going to be stuck staying awake, playing this over in your head? How, how, how will shame rear its ugly head out in our life in ways we don't even realize it or expect it or see it? And how many people will you and I hurt along the way because we haven't dealt with the shame in our lives? You see, the consequence of confession is not near as great as the consequence of shame. Living in hiding always seems so much easier and it seems so much better for us, but it's not actually true. When you and I come clean, it, it forces us to face the consequences and they are real. But it's actually in this moment where we actually start to release control, release control of the outcomes of what is to come, that there is actually our last step and that is freedom. It's in the releasing of control that you and I can actually find freedom. Can you imagine for a moment, like literally imagine this in your heart and in your life, that you would have a life that has no shame in it at all. Like, can you picture that for just a moment that you're fully you, that you're fully alive and that you're fully free? Can, can you just imagine what that would be like? And I recognize it. There's going to be consequences. For some of us, it might mean like literal jail time. It might mean the end of our marriage. It might mean losing some relationships. It might mean dealing with the lies that we've... Like there are real consequences. I, I understand that is true for you and for me. But I just want you to imagine for a moment your soul being healthy. That is what God wants for you more than anything. Like what, what you did had real consequences. But when we lean into that conviction and we can actually ask God for forgiveness and we can go to the people that we have wronged, 
we can actually be healed. You can be free because of what Jesus has done for you and for me. And that, my friends, is incredibly good news. <laughs> Amen. Now, this path is hard. It is not easy. Following Jesus is not the easy path. And if anybody sold you that, I'm sorry. It's not. But walking a path filled with shame is not easy either. And today, what I believe is God is, is inviting you and I to a life of freedom. So I'm going to invite the worship team back out. And as they come back out to uh, lead us in song, I, I want to read to you this morning, and I'll, and I'll even have it up on the screen for you as well. It's a portion from the end of the Adam and Eve story from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Here's what it says. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. God said this, it will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake. I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And he would. One day, God himself would come. You see, you and I live in this fallen, broken world as a result of sin. But because of Jesus, you and I have the option to accept forgiveness from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus died for you so that you may be free. And I actually just want to invite you for just a moment to um, talk to Jesus. I'm going to invite you to actually um, bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And in, I want there to be a sense of urgency for us to deal with this, because I think our temptation is to always punt this down the field and think, I'm going to deal with this later. So I want to invite you, and I even want to challenge you to, to deal with this in the next 48 hours. I think it starts here right now. And maybe there's some follow-up that needs to take place. But I want you to do this. I want you to just start by praying to be convicted or to accept what you already know that you messed up and you haven't dealt with. Second, I want you to confess your sin to God and to confess your sin to somebody safe in your life. Third, I want you to accept the consequences of what has happened and I want you to pursue the support you need to get through this hard time. And lastly, I want you to pray to God for courage because you're going to need it. You can't just do this on your own. You can't just white knuckle it. You're going to need God to give you help. But he is here and he wants that freedom for you and for your life. There's this wonderful passage from Philippians 1 verses 3 through 6. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and I think it's an important message for you to hear as well. He says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you realize that God is doing a good work in you, in your heart? Do you know that God is not finished with you yet? Do you know that your worst moment does not define you? That you are actually defined by Jesus's greatest moment? That you are forgiven and that you are made clean because of the blood of Jesus? Church, I wanna tell you this morning, God does not want you to be wrapped up in shame any longer. His heart for you is a heart that would be you living life abundantly, fully, and free. So the question for you to wrestle with right now is will you accept his love? Will you accept his forgiveness? Will you be courageous enough to be honest? 
with it. I will tell you, Jesus is trustworthy to go to with this. He wants to hear from you today. And so I'm gonna invite you to talk to him right now. Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the freedom that you offer to us to not leave us stuck in our shame, but to offer us a pathway out of it. We don't deserve it, but you have still given it to us. And we know it cost you dearly. And so we say, thank you, Jesus. Would you continue to work in our hearts and in our lives to allow us to be free from the shame that so easily entangles us. We declare our love for you, Jesus, and our trust in you this morning. And all who agree with that prayer said amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we turn our gaze to Jesus and worship him?